All right, thanks everyone. Um, how many people here have heard of uh, TensorFlow? <laughs> All right, uh, I assume it's about roughly 110%. Um, so with today's talk, I'm gonna talk about scaling Google's uh, deep learning library on Spark. And we're gonna, and, and this is the work of uh, you know, a lot of members of the team. Chris Smith here, he'll have part of the talk. Ushnish, Wu Fam, and, and Nanda Kishore. And Nanda runs our, uh, our team, a team called uh, DSAR, uh, Data Science and Advanced Research. Okay, and, and you may wonder what, what an enterprise software company uh, have to do with, with having such a large team in, in basic research. Um, so I'll, I'll set a context for our deep learning work. Uh, how many people here saw my talk on distributed deep learning on Swark and Tachyon here in New York last November? Okay, so nobody did. That, that was at Strata. Um, so that was uh, so the first time we talked about the, the architectures of our deep learning work uh, on top of Spark. And as you can see, Spark is inherent in, in, in uh, every column there. We've been working on Spark for a very long time. Uh, December 2013, the very first Spark Summit, we uh, did the first uh, interactive application on Spark. And so we started the deep learning uh, work about a year ago. Um, so in November, I talked about distributing Spark, uh, or deep learning on Spark, and actually it was mainly the feature there was about talking about using Tachyon as the parameter server. Okay. Today, I'm gonna talk about what we've done in the past few months on taking TensorFlow and scaling it out horizontally. I'll talk about motivation for why we do that. Uh, I think it's really important, and there are some lessons learned about when that makes sense and when it doesn't make sense. Uh, in June, <coughs> we'll be talking about TensorFlow ensembles, right? So a, a different kind of parallelization also on Spark. Um, hopefully that paper gets into Hadoop Summit. All right, so this talk is divided into six parts. I'll, I'll talk about the motivation, why we do this, and then share with you the various architectural considerations, right? I think part of the reason that, that many of you are here is to say, well, what do we really mean when we parallelize or distribute uh, TensorFlow on Spark? There are different ways that you can do that. Uh, then share with you, given the architecture that we have chosen for this particular presentation, uh, the, the various experimental parameters around that, and then present you with the results from, from those experiments. And then Chris will share with you the lessons learned, and then we'll summarize, okay? Um, this clock is not going, that means I have infinite time. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. 18 minutes left, really? Um, okay, so I'm gonna move, have to move through this motivation very quickly. The main point I wanna make here is that there are people that say, you know, Google is gonna uh, release a distributed version of TensorFlow, why even bother? Well, in the absolute sense, you could ask that question, but the main motivation here is that we have customers, and, and this whole summit is about Spark. And if you already have a Spark deployment and you say, well, I wanna add one more workload and I wanna have a deep learning workload, and by the way, I, you know, it'd be nice if I can take advantage of Google TensorFlow, then this is the motivation for that, all right? So this is why we want to look at TensorFlow on Spark for a lot of customers that already have a Spark deployment and doing other things with Spark. So I'll do a quick review. This one we can move through quickly. TensorFlow essentially thinks about, uh, it's, a, it's, a gen, it's a more general architecture to support general compute graphs, okay? And so you can think of a neural network or a deep learning network as essentially a, uh, su such a flow and sort of there's tensors flowing through these different, com uh, these different um, uh, components. Uh, Google uses this for TensorFlow. Uh, basically, a lot of Google's uh, implementation of uh, the, the, the products essentially now runs on this architecture. Um, so uh, I like to present this because it's a really a single graph, uh, a single chart that can show you various considerations when you do distributed deep learning. And this comes from the disbelief paper uh, that was published uh, of about four years ago uh, by Jeff Dean and, and the team, the Google Brain team there. So when you think about distributing uh, almost anything, but particularly deep learning, you can think about whether it's model parallel or data parallel, right? You can also think about model tournaments where you run individual, you know, single machine 
comp uh, competition and then sort of pick the best parameter, or pick the best uh, model. So in terms of model replicas here, right? So you can think of this as taking a large model and divide it up into smaller pieces and then have a single machine deal with a, a, a subset of the model. So that would be considered model parallel. Data parallel is much more straightforward, which is you take the training data and you take one subset of that and you say, well, this machine, you're responsible for this shard and then this machine, you're responsible for this other shard. So data parallel or model parallel or both, okay? And in the case of disbelief, there was, uh, both were used. The second major thing I wanted you to pay attention to is that somehow or other in the architecture, you're going to have one component that computes the gradients, right? This is the one that, that essentially take the set of existing parameters and then compute where it should go next. And then send those gradients to another place, and we typically refer to that as the parameter server, and it'll take those gradients and then update the, the, the latest model using those gradients to the next place. So there's a very clear, when you think about gradient descent, there's a place where the gradients are computed and there's a place where the, the descent is done. Okay, so with that general architecture in mind, I'll share with you <coughs> what we've done. I'm gonna skip this and this sort of explains why a company like ours has, has uh, deep learning research. All right, so in the context of this talk, this is what we've done. You think the equivalent of the parameter server and the gradient computers here. So essentially this is what we've done in the Spark cluster. Uh, you all know there's a driver and there's a whole bunch of workers. We're using, in this case, the driver for the parameter server, okay? And in detail, the parameter server in this case is an HTTP server that, that takes the models, uh, take the gradients and, and send the models back out. Each of the workers will do the, the, the gradient computing. Okay, and we have an instance of TensorFlow running on each of these machines. All right, so essentially it's TensorFlow talking to each other. Okay, I think that's straightforward. Um, in, in other, there's work still going on uh, at, at Arimo where, for example, we replaced the driver, which is the parameter server, with a tachyon cluster. And tachyon would then be responsible for doing the parameter serving. So if you were, or you can go back and look at the video of the talk that I gave in November about Tachyon's role as a parameter server there, it's actually quite cool. So a lot of performance numbers that you see here will be significantly improved when the parameter service, or the parameter server is, is, in, is done in Tachyon. I, we're, we're, we're not ready to present that work on, tach, on TensorFlow yet, it's not done. So in this talk, I'll just talk about using the driver uh, as, as that sort of single machine parameter server. Uh, this talks to that. So <clears throat> essentially we are at the Spark only stage for, uh, for TensorFlow, for our imp uh, implementation of TensorFlow. We, we would then move over to using Tachyon uh, as the model store, and then we would use the HTTP server for parameter server, and ultimately we would use Tachyon as a, in the co-processing mode uh, for, uh, and, and that's what we did actually for the work in November. Okay, but that was without TensorFlow. That was Spark only with tacking on, on, the, on the parameter server side. So think of today's talk as, as this portion here, but the coolness comes from t using TensorFlow for the gradient computing. All right, so with that architecture in mind, what are the experimental parameters? Uh, we, we use three different data sets. The intent here is to vary both the data size, the training data size, as well as the model size and then you know, scaling across these things, okay? Oh, I have a full 23 minutes. I can slow down. <laughs> that thing is jumping up and down. Um, so <clears throat> these are the various experimental dimensions. Number one, we vary the data set size, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Second, we vary the model size. And three, we scale by compute size. And so throughout the, uh, when I present the results, I'll be referring to either the number of executors in Spark or the number of cores. And for us, it's you know, a ratio of eight to one. And then finally, you know, because of TensorFlow, we're able to sort of easily just switch to GPU mode. So let's see what happens when we use TensorFlow in GPU mode. How much speed up do we get? And it's really interesting in terms of speed up in a single machine configuration 
as well as in a distributed configuration. So by, by the way, the compute size, we also do a, just a single machine, not distributed over, over Spark, just for comparison. So here are some of the interesting results. Um, this is the obligatory you know, training convergence uh, uh, slide. Uh, the thing to observe here is that um, if you're familiar with mini batch training, meaning right, th these are all data parallel, and each worker is working with a subset of the data. In fact, they're w working not only with a subset, a partition of data, they're working with you know, sub-batches within that, that subset. And so every time they get that mini batch done, they will then com com communicate the gradients to the parameter server and the, 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 the model will be updated. Now, the, quest the reasonable question would come up is that if, if these things are sort of running in parallel, sort of semi-asynchronously, would everything sort of line up, right? Would the model end up converging? And the answer is yes, right? And if you read in a research paper, you see that sort of, it, it just works, but within reason. And so there's this effect of what we have, for example, we have 16 executors and 24 executors, meaning there's a lot of parallel things going on. So you see this convergence has this weird, you know, bouncing up and down. And the reason for that is because when they become sort of out of sync, uh, which is okay, but you could end up getting old, old gradients, right? Gradients that came from uh, a high point somewhere and said you should be going this direction, but you're actually applying that gradient to you know, another location already. And that may actually end up increasing the error, right? And so that, when, whenever you do uh, mini batch training, you're gonna see this bouncing behavior, okay? But in terms of convergence, eventually it gets there. All right, so. <clears throat> And, and by the way, that was by number of iterations, not by time, okay? So for 24 executors, the number of iterations will be done much faster, right? So if you scale that by time, then convergence happens faster with the, uh, with the larger number of ex executors. All right, okay, what is the effect of scaling by number of cores? And this is a slightly busy slide, so I'm gonna break it down. First, we're gonna ignore the leftmost number of points, uh, uh, leftmost there. The leftmost is a single machine GPU configuration, okay? So we actually build a machine uh, using NVIDIA GPU, we call it Hinton, right? So the left one is a Hinton machine. The, the three to the right, that's the Spark distributed configuration. So let's concentrate on that first. So you see all three uh, molecular data set, MNIST dataset and Higgs dataset has a behavior that I call saturation, right? So there's the initial scaling, linear scaling going up as you increase the number of cores, and then it just flattens out. This is really flat, it's within experimental error. You see the same thing here, the red, which is a, a larger model size going up and also saturating. And then still larger going up and saturating, okay? So the saturation comes from the communication overhead. That these model parameters have to be, the gradients have to be communicated back to the parameter server. Parameter ser server has sent back the model. That network communication essentially kills you, right? You have a question? Uh, yeah, just to clarify, so you're doing data parallel, not model parallel? That's correct. Data, yeah, the question is, are we doing data parallel or model parallel? We're doing just data parallel here. All right. So. It is reasonable to expect to see that you see that saturation effect, right? As you add more cores, eventually we become overwhelmed by communication of the models going back and forth between the gradient computer and the, and the descender, okay? The other uh, interesting consistent effect is to see that, that the, the saturation happens earlier when you have a larger model. That makes sense, right? Okay. And so now we can pay attention to what happened to the single machine configuration. And so that effect isn't quite there because it's essentially just local RAM communication, right? So the communication speed there is quasi-infinite. So that's why you don't see that degradation. But interestingly, when you do have a model large enough, eventually it kicks in. And that's what, uh, that's what we're seeing with, with the uh, molecular data set, okay? So there is essentially, the main point here is, obviously there's a, trait, there's a saturation when you scale out too much. But also there's an interesting comparison, the trade-off between single machine and distributed. 
Okay, and I'll, I'll talk more about that as we go. Second, we increase the model size and see the effect. Now, the, the, the vertical axis is a synthetic parameter. We take the time, we invert it, the time for training per, per one epoch. We invert it, and then we normalize it to sort of itself. So it gives you a sense of speed relative to the number of rows of data per minute or per unit time, right? You know, to your point, we're doing data parallel, so we're interested in how many rows can I get through, right, per minute? And it makes perfect sense that the number of rows you can get through per minute goes down as your model size increases, right? And it's interesting that that effect in terms of percentage is pretty consistent across, you know, no matter how many cores you put. So it's roughly about, you know, a degradation of 10% in speed for every 1x, you know, addition in, uh, in, in, in the model size, okay? So over a sort of factor of eight increase in model size, we see almost an, sort of an 80% decrease. Okay. Um, then the next thing we looked at is that we invert that and look at the time because we're interested now in the effect of that communication saturation, right? So if you invert that and look at the time, you see what is what we call the residual time. In other words, even if you have an infinite speed, right, if you have infinite compute resources, right, go all the way to the right, you're never going to get faster than your ability to communicate the, the model parameters you know, between, uh, between all the compute units. So then it makes sense that that saturation or that residual time is largest for the largest data set, okay? So essentially it is here, it's relative to one. So you can say sort of half of that time in the molecular data set is spent communicating the model, okay, here. And then if you have the model size large, smaller, then the saturation becomes a, a, a smaller fraction of the time. All right, and I think this is the last uh, results uh, set. Uh, the, the interesting thing here is that there are five configurations here that we're comparing. And I'll go from left to right. Um, the blue is just a local single machine configuration. That's the NVIDIA GPU supercomputer that we built. And I'm sorry, just, but, but we use that machine just in CPU mode, just to see the speed up when we actually use the local GPU. So the first two are local CPU only, and then local with GPU activated, all right? The next one is that distributed across 32 cores, CPU only, and then distributed across 32 cores with GPU. And then finally distributed across 64, okay? With CPU only. Of course, your natural question is why didn't, you know, what about distributed 64 GPU? We just didn't have time to, to get that data. All right, but the trends are pretty clear. With the smallest <coughs> data set, right, with the MNIST, we can see that as we go from left to right, we get a steady improvement in the, in the normalized speed, okay? And we call it relative speed is that all of these speeds are normalized to this blue curve here. So this is one, and everything else is relative to it, okay? So we see that we get a speed up when we go to G GPU, right? And so here, the speed up is probably, this is one, and this is about 1.5. Okay, so we get a 50% speed up. Now, you might expect, is that all we're gonna get with GPU? Uh, well, let's go across here. On the molecular data set, the speed up is one to six. And in the Higgs data set, the speed up is one to nine. So in fact, GPU can speed things up a lot, right? And the reason it's not so much for MNIST is because that's a very, small data set, okay? So with larger data sets and or larger models, G GPU, you know, you win a lot, okay? And in fact, in those cases, you're actually better off with a single machine configuration. The minute we distribute it across 32 cores, look at the drop, right? And in fact, this drop is never, or not even up to here, not gained back, right? Even when we go to from yellow to green, that is distributed 32 and distributed 32 GPU, right? Distributed 32 GPU, in fact, is faster than distributed 32, but we don't get the speed of a single machine. That's because the communication overhead is there, okay? So then, when you look at this, you might wonder, well, when, 
this is a very strong argument against distributing uh, uh, deep learning, right? And in fact, in a sense it is. Essentially, we have to be aware of what regime we are operating in, okay? So there's a regime where you have very small data sets, and yes, you do get the speed gain from GPU, and you do get the speed gain from uh, distributing, right? Th that's this left-hand left side here. And there's this other regime where you have sort of moderately sized data sets, where generally you're better off just staying in, GP, uh, in single machine, and if you have a single machine with GPU, do that, okay? Now, there's another regime where either the model size is so large, or particularly the data set is so large, right? In other words, then you can no longer hold all of your data set in memory, and it's gonna be streaming from disk or something, in which case distributing it further will help, okay? As you can see the trend here, we didn't go that far out, but you can see that, in fact, the, the ratio between single machine and distributed becomes smaller. As, you know, you, so you can imagine another cluster here going out, and you can see that the single machine configuration will essentially top out at some point. It can't go beyond its own capacity, okay? So just to summarize that, essentially in, there's a regime of very small and very large where distributed helps in terms of speed, right? And in between, you're better off using single machine, GPU, if that's the configuration. Of course, as I said at the top of the talk, the motivation for a lot of people is say, I already have the Spark cluster. I don't want to go build an NVIDIA computer. Excuse me. That's, that's what I didn't want to happen, because it's being extreme. Uh, I, I already have a Spark cluster, and, and, and you know, I just want to add this as, a, as, a, as a, another workload. So in that sense, you're not looking for absolute performance, but just looking for economies of scale of your infrastructure, and that makes perfect sense as well. So that's a different dimension to consider. Okay, with that, I will ask Chris to come over and talk about lessons learned, because he did most of the work. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I'm on. So, uh, four minutes, that is a number. So, um, okay, so, so, you know, as you saw in the previous slide, GPU on a local machine is about 10 times faster. You do get faster by putting your GPU on a Spark cluster, but it's not the same speed up because you know, it's like you've got the system, it's got multiple pieces, the compute piece is only one piece, and if you, you, know, if you make it small enough, then something else becomes the bottleneck, the critical path. So, um, yeah, so, so I think the, the, one of the in, uh, important aspects when you're trying to design the, the, you know, a, a Spark cluster with a GPU on it is the GPU memory is limited. So that means if your model size is too big, you start to have to be kind of clever with carving it up into smaller pieces. And if you want to start throwing more GPUs at it, um, it, it involves some more complication with uh, you know, managing dependencies and actually the, you know, GPUs have their own, they're like their own computers, they have their own memory on them and so you have to move your matrix or whatever into the GPU's memory to do that and so that, that bus can actually be a, a significant bottleneck compared with um, the, the computing capacity of the GPU. Which is, I mean, the, the ones we were using, they were on AWS, they, uh, they had 1500 cores. Um, they were actually pretty old compared to I mean, you know, they were good, but, uh, but you can really spend a lot of money on GPUs if you want. Um, and so, so there's a minor caveat is uh, if you want to use AWS GPU instances, you have to build TensorFlow from source and insert some special configuration flags. But we have a, uh, it's, it's an open source project and we have a script to help you do that. So, um, and it's also on TensorFlow's website, so, you know, read along. Um, so, okay, so this is a pretty interesting thing. So, so you might wonder why does this, um, downpour gradient descent method even work. Um, and and so, so we really recommend doing an initial warm-up phase, and what we mean by that is there is a, uh, you have a period of training where you aren't distributing it. It's only the parameter server, the driver, does train by itself for a while. And the effect of this is that you might imagine, it, I guess you can think of it as like, a, like an error surface, right? You have this sort of uh, function that describes how wrong you are uh, for a given set of parameters, and, and you, want, you want to be less wrong, so you want to like flow downhill like water. And, uh, and you know, maybe this, this, this landscape kind of, it's really high dimensional, but you can just think of it like a landscape. You know, it has, has valleys, and it has mountains, and it has um, you know, little gnomes sitting on it and stuff. And, and when you, 
come on, it's a joke. What is this? <laughs> so, so the idea is that, that if, if you happen to be sitting on the ridge of a mountain and then you start flowing downhill, you know, all these, all these different uh, uh, workers are slightly out of sync with each other. So they might be, start training going down into different local optima. So the idea behind the warm-up is that there's, there's really, you know, you're, you're confined in a, a box, really. Or you, there's, you know, the machine doesn't have infinite precision. Um, so, so there's a finite number of these cusps, right? So if you do a warm-up, and then you put a lot of these cusps behind you, because you're you're, your workers aren't going to climb back uphill to, like, go over the other side of the mountain. So, um, so basically, yeah, so you can kind of think, think of it that, that it's like raindrops falling on, on, on this hill, and they all, they're all falling on different parts of the hill, but they all pool at the bottom. Right? So that's the kind of like, um, idea we want to uh, keep in your head about this. But, so, so even though you do the warm-up, you still may see a, a kind of wobble effect. And, uh, and this is pretty interesting because, because they are out of sync. And if you think about, you, know, you have this gradient, which is like telling you which way to go, but it's like, it's not actually, you know, it's like you have your error surface and you have a tangent plane pasted to it. So your gradient is sitting in the tangent plane and it's, and it's, that tangent plane is a good approximation of that error surface, but only within a small neighborhood, right? So if, if one of your workers goes off and works for too long in some other direction, it's no longer, it's no longer relevant to the, all the other workers. It's like that guy at a meeting, you know, where uh, he's like five minutes behind everyone else and so he keeps bringing up things that everyone else already knows and he's just sort of holding everybody back. And the way that manifests in, uh, in, in, this, in the training curve is that you get this kind of wobble uh, where it's, you have these obsolete gradients in, get introduced and then they throw everyone off and they have to find their way back. And it can actually end up having a kind of oscillation due to uh, some of the like, momentum effects in these optimizing algorithms so that you get this nice, like, you know, uh, uh, damped oscillation. Um, but of course, that's not really what you want. It's kind of wasting time. Uh, so yeah, so how can you get around this wobble effect, or how can you like reduce it? Because sometimes it actually becomes undamped and will uh, become exponential if you if you uh, uh, if it goes too wrong. So so one thing you can do is just drop the obsolete gradients. You know, you say if gradient arrives too too late, if it's taking too long, either you know network overhead is or something like that, uh, just drop it, forget about it. Um, another thing you can do is you can reduce the learning rate. That means that everybody's taking smaller steps. And so, in effect, it's like they're all sinking more frequently so that they don't get as, as far away from each other. Um, also, what initial parameters you use it makes a big difference in this because it also affects the size of the gradients. Um, you can also reduce the mini-batch size, um, which, is, again, just amounts to sinking more often. Um, Chris? Yeah, time to go. Okay. So, yeah, and then another last thing is, is pay attention to, like, things you like how big the model you're sending through the network is, you know, you want to compress it, uh, and that will help you get, go faster. And, okay, so yeah, advice. So you should only run one TensorFlow instance per machine. So we have one executor per machine, one TensorFlow instance. On, uh, per, and that, the reason for that is because TensorFlow doesn't know it's in a Spark cluster. It can actually kind of get out from under yarn, uh, it seems like sometimes. So, so if you have multiple TensorFlow instances, uh, they tend to stomp on each other and, and the cores start thrashing. Uh, you can actually tune it a little bit. You can say it has internal parallelism between the operations and within the operations. But, uh, so you can change the number of uh, threads for that, but even changing that, there's, uh, TensorFlow will just start up dozens of cores sometimes, or uh, threads. So, so yeah, so we found we can just smooth that out, one TensorFlow instance per machine. Um, yeah, and so yeah, we compress the, if you can make the gradient smaller, if you reduce the network overhead, that makes you go faster and also has a um, less wobble. And yeah, so, so the batch size trade-off, this is, this is a natural thing in machine learning, but it, it uh, gets amplified here. You want, you know, if, you're, if you've got a smaller batch size, you're gonna, con you're gonna be more accurate, but you're gonna take longer and you're gonna be, because you're gonna be communicating more often and you're gonna have to uh, stop and back propagate more often. So, so it's a trade-off. Um, you want to do the conclusion? All right, cool. All right, I'll do it quickly so we can leave time for Q&A. Thank you, Chris. All right, so as I implied earlier, this, this particular implementation, right, there are ways to speed things up, for example, using Tachyon and so but this particular architecture that we share here is best for every very large data sets and smaller models, right? The communication overhead uh, is, a, is a concern. For large models, we're looking into model parallelism as well as you know 
you know, more advanced techniques for model compression. So if your data fits in a single machine and you don't have any motivation to use Spark distribution, uh, distributed computing, then a single machine GPU would be best. In fact, if, you, know, you, you can build a supercomputer using, uh, using NVIDIA cards for about four or $5,000. Uh, for large data sets, you can leverage both the speed and scale using a Spark cluster with GPUs. Um, our future work is to put Tachyon. Um, we, we've done that before, and we're just gonna re replicate that architecture over to the Tachyon configuration. And then also using the Tachyon in an Ensembles configuration, all right? <clears throat> and, and that'll be at uh, Hadoop Summit in June 2016. Um, finally, I want to announce that we are open sourcing it, and because this is our own work, there's no dependency on other things, so we can open source it today. So if you go to github.com slash adetau, that was the old company name. We changed our company name just, uh, just a month ago. It's, a remo is much more fun and easy to remember, easy to now. So go, go there, and that it's, already, it's already public, right? Mm -hmm. That's cool. right. Excellent. And uh, if the Q&A is not sufficient, I'll be at booth K8. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, I'm so proud of this. We were, it was a surprise we were named by Fast Company as one of the world's top 10 most innovative companies in data science. All right, so come see us, Q&A. Hey, Thank you, Christopher. Um, I think we'll have maybe a minute for questions, and after that. Can you define again, I don't know if you want to show the graph again, but you mean it's good for large data sets. Why do you, what is large? Oh, you mean the number? Number. Well, rows. I mean, in your exper experiments, you, I think you didn't show the more experiments. Yeah, it's, it's but large. what do you recommend as rows size for yeah. implementing TensorFlow over Spark? Yeah. Well, what's large relative to your cluster size, right? In other words, the, the idea is that you can think of the ratio of how many rows each, each executor has to process, right? And if that ratio is a small number, right? then it's not, it's not worth distributing. But if it's a larger number and it exceeds a single, uh, a single uh, machine configuration, then there's gonna be a, tr a turnover. So you recommend more than, than that, right? Yes, it would be more than that because in the, uh, that's exactly right, because in the result that I showed you, you can see the trend happening, but it hasn't reached that crossover yet. Uh, there's a slide there somewhere. At this point, let's take other questions offline. Okay. Yeah. Um, we'll be having a five-minute break. Okay. Yeah. Come and uh, you know, we can we can speak at the booth. <laughs>